We're live. Thank you so much for joining us. What's up, everybody? This is our first ever live streamed event for conservation in the classroom. My name is Kate. I will be your host for today. Today's presentation is about to be the first of many to come, where WWF and Wild Classroom aim to connect our young students across the country with our awesome team of experts. We're really excited for today's presentation because it comes right in time for World Oceans Day tomorrow, so get excited. Before I introduce our presenter for today, I want to allow each of our classrooms that we have joining us live on screen the opportunity to say hi and introduce themselves. So um, we have, let's see, Miss Crosido's class from Jersey City, New Jersey. What's up, you guys? Hi. Awesome. We also have, let's see, Miss Martin's class from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Hi. Hi, guys. We have the Helping Ninjas from Carmel, Indiana. What's up, guys? Hi. Awesome. Um, let's see, we also have Miss Wolfer's class from Middle Island, New York. There they are. Awesome. And finally, hailing from our presenter's hometown elementary school, we have Mr. Haas's class in Novi, Michigan. <laughs> Awesome. Well, we're really glad to have you guys here. I think we also have a few classes watching live off camera. So if you are one of them, please feel free to give yourself a shout out on the chat function on your screen. And we will be sure to watch those questions coming in as Erin's giving her presentation. So of course, the reason you all are here is to hear from our presenter, Erin Simon. She is the Director for Sustainability Research and Development here at the World Wildlife Fund. Erin is interested in how plastics and other materials impact our environment. And she's gonna to talk to us a little bit today about how we can reduce those impacts and do our part to protect the planet. So Erin, thank you so much for joining us. And without further ado, please take it away. Hi everybody, can you guys hear me okay? Great. All right. I am so excited to be here. I am going to uh, share some slides with you and um, talk to you a bit about plastics and this crisis that we're facing um, around plastic pollution. So let me share my screen up here. All right. Let's get to know plastics in nature. That's what we're trying to do. So I'm Erin Simon. I'm so excited for you guys to come in here and we're gonna talk a bit about what the problem is, why it's there, what WWF is doing and what I do at WWF, and then um, talk a little bit about what you guys can do um, to help us solve this problem. Uh, to begin with, I wanted to start by telling you a little bit about myself and how I came into this role. Um, as, as was mentioned in my introduction, I grew up in Novi, Michigan and went to Village Oaks Elementary School like uh, Mr. Justice's classroom there, and um, uh, Justin's class there, sorry. And um, I then went off to go to Michigan State University and got my degree in packaging engineering. So uh, my job was really to figure out how to put things in boxes and plastics and foams and make sure they got stuff pretty safely, uh, got to the consumer really safely. And um, the first place I actually worked was actually not in Michigan, but in Idaho. And I worked for a company called Hewlett Packard who makes computers and printers and sells photo paper and ink. And while working there, I moved to Richmond, Virginia and got to know some of the folks at the World Wildlife Fund because Hewlett Packard was looking to source their pulp and paper more sustainably. And so as I got to know many of the pandas that work at this organization, uh, that's what we call ourselves. Um, we, uh, they asked me to come and uh, lead up work on engaging with companies on packaging and material science, trying to figure out where materials play a role in conservation, both in the impacts that they have on the planet, but also um, the opportunities that they can, they can provide in 
creating conservation benefit. So again, we're going to talk about the plastic problem today, right? Because this is what we see everywhere. You see it in the news. You see it um, on, on TV and in, um, in videos. And, and it's a really, really big problem. Because today, about 8 million metric tons of plastic enter our ocean every year. To put that into like terms that you can understand, you know the dump trucks that come through and collect your garbage every week? About one full dump truck of plastic is entering our ocean every minute. That is a lot of plastic that's going in there. And when it gets in there, it persists. That means it just lasts and lasts. It doesn't break down um, and go away. Um, and so what happens when it's there is that it impacts our species. Um, they, we know that there's over 800 species that have come into contact with plastics in the ocean. They get tangled up in it, like this poor sea turtle here, or they eat it, or they end up having it affect their habitat where they live. And we all know that none of those interactions are good. And so a couple of scientists came together about uh, five years ago, almost five years ago, and asked, why do we have this problem? Why is there so much plastic ending up in the ocean? And what it really got to was that with the world's population growing, um, there are places in this world today that don't have a lot of waste management. They don't have those trucks that come around. And so in those places, they happen to exist where there's a lot of population growth. So they're having more and they're making, you know, they're growing more and more. And in that process, they are just creating more waste. And, and so situations like this in Southeast Asia are pretty common. And you may wonder, well, why, why would that happen? Why wouldn't they just throw it into their bin and, and then make sure it goes off to a place that can manage that waste? Well, this is what it looks like in their backyards often, right? Um, you know, they are, they're just throwing their bags of trash into those channels. And those channels are then taking that waste right out to the ocean. And so you can imagine that this issue doesn't just impact the turtles and the seabirds and the whales that WWF is concerned about protecting all the time. It also, uh, it also impacts people, those communities who live where sometimes you see more trash than you do nature. And that impacts the health of their water and their air. Um, it also impacts the fish stocks that they depend on for both livelihoods and food, because um, this is really not a healthy ecosystem for fish to thrive. And so as we look at photos like this and others, the first reaction that we all have is the same. That does not belong there. We should get rid of it, right? Let's get rid of plastic. And the reality is, is that is not going to actually solve the problem, and it may cause other problems. Because plastics actually have some conservation value. They extend shelf life. So we, and what that means is that we can wrap our food in them and then it can safely get um, all over the world in a way that the food does not go to waste. Because that to grow food takes a lot of environmental cost. It takes land and water and chemicals. And so we want to make sure we protect that, those inputs. Um, plastics also help us to lightweight cars and to airplanes, and that means they can, they takes less fuel to fly them. And I don't know about you guys, but I wouldn't want to go into a doctor's office um, and not have single-use plastics because those those rubber gloves and those um, the single-use plastics that they use there allow me to get access to safe healthcare. So the question that WWF has to ask is, how do we take this material that clearly adds value to humanity? but it's also wreaking havoc on our species and on our ecosystems. And the way we solve for that is the same way that we solve for most problems. Um, because we are looking at the entire, we're looking at the world, right? We're looking at wildlife, the ecosystems they depend on, so forests and oceans and freshwater. And we're looking at these huge systems, um, the food system and the climate system that really interact with all of those ecosystems and those species. Because what we don't want to do is while we're solving for a problem like plastic waste in our oceans, is that we don't want to create another problem in our forests or in our food systems. So WWF is always taking this holistic approach to make sure that we can really solve for these problems in a way um, that is leading to more, a more sustainable future across the board. So with this plastics issue, and since it's such a big one, WWF determined that we want no more plastics in nature. That's what we want at the top, you know, a top level. We want plastics to stop ending up in nature. 
Not only is that wreaking havoc when it gets there, but it's a waste of resources because it took it took resources from the planet to, to make those materials in the first place. And so we shouldn't just throw them away. We should recycle them or reuse them so that we can get value back and continue to use that over and over again, asking the planet for a bit less. Now to do this by 2030 will take a lot because the scientists who have been looking into this know that 2030 is pretty ambitious, that really it's probably only possible to get halfway there. But we believe that if we get everybody involved, including you guys, that we can that we can achieve this. And so the way we're approaching this is to ask everybody to play a part. We're working with cities because as you saw on that on those pictures, there are a number of cities especially in Southeast Asia and in some in India and other areas where they just don't have waste management yet today. And how can we help them to build that up and to think about the right policies and expertise they need to do that so they too can have cleaner, cleaner um, spaces. We're also working with policymakers, and policymakers are our government officials, and that's not just in the U.S., but all over the world, so that they put into place legislation and rules that, every, that can make sure that the changes happen the way they need to happen. Uh, and then we need to engage the public. We need to make sure that folks like you and your parents and consumers alike know the roles that they can play so they understand how they can influence policymakers, how they can influence companies by, you know, through their purchasing power. And then, of course, how they can make sure that they are good stewards of plastics and those materials they're using by thinking about how they use them and making sure they recycle them when they're done. And the work that I lead up on is actually engaging with companies because companies make all these products. And so while they can't solve for this on their own, they have an important role to play, too. I can help them to think about how they make those products making sure that they put the stuff in them that's coming from good places, making sure they're using recycled content and sustainably sourced bio-based, and then thinking about wherever those products end up in the world that we can get them back. So whether that's by influencing those policymakers and the public and the retailers and the cities, or if it's about thinking about a totally new way to sell products. Um, and so that's a lot of the work I'm doing with them. And so I wanted to share with you a story, uh, something that one example of the way I've been working with companies just recently. About two weeks ago, I got on this ship right here and joined a whole bunch of people trying to solve this problem on the Ocean Plastic Leadership Summit in the North Atlantic Gyre. So for those of you trying to visualize where that North Atlantic Gyre is, if you think about the East Coast of the U.S., find North Carolina, and then just go, uh, you know, keep heading east into the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. That's where Bermuda sits. And around Bermuda is this gyre. It's a place where the ocean currents all kind of circle the water. And so in that, a lot of stuff collects. And especially in places where you have grass like this, which is called sargassum grass. And that grass acts like a net. It catches a lot of good stuff and fish love to feed off of it. And so as we were sailing through the Atlantic and we would come upon some of this sargassum grass, we would hop into our zodiacs, as you see pictured here, and we would jump into the water and we would clean out that sargassum grass. And in this upper right corner, you can see what we pulled out of that grass. It's a lot of different interesting stuff. There is a toilet seat in there. There are shoes. There are bottles, there's a piece of a chair, there's parts of fishing gear and packaging and forks and knives and a toothbrush. So all this stuff is just collecting there. And we were to helping to clean it out. But what's hard to see is how, as that material gets smaller and smaller, as it's broken up by the water, by fish eating it, and by just sort of degrading a little bit over time, it actually becomes really, really tiny. We call these macroplastics because they're big and you can grab them. But the majority of the plastic in the ocean is actually what we would call microplastics. So we also went to the beach and pulled through the same sargassum grass as you see it on this beach. And we picked up what is in this upper left corner is a lot of that small little plastic peaches that get stuck in the grass um, as it's getting broken apart. And so what was beyond these cleanups, actually, was what we could do once we allowed ourselves to be inspired by the issue. You know, we're in the middle of this. We're surrounded by the problem in the middle of this, what should be a pristine ecosystem. And we're on the boat with people who make plastics, 
people who buy and, and make stuff out of those plastics, like so brands like Coca-Cola and Nestle and Hasbro who makes toys and Burt's Bees who makes chapstick. And we were talking about how do we solve this problem because it's really big and we need everybody to be involved. And so the majority of the time spent on that ship was actually problem solving. It was looking at all the places in the plastic value chain. And that's what that's from sourcing the materials to make plastic and to making them, to selling them, to using them and to getting them into recycling or going to landfill. All the places in there where we're where where we have barriers to actually creating a really closed loop and reusing those materials. And each of the teams on the ship's job was to really break that down and try to solve for their barrier. And so this is my team working to figure out how we do that. And a lot of my work looks like this. It's about getting people together from all throughout uh, the, you know, everybody who has a role to play in solving the problem and helping them to inspire them and think differently about it, you know, to break down the, the existing ways of thinking and say, okay, what we've been doing, what we've been doing for the past to solve for this problem, which has really been, you know, using less plastic, making it recyclable, using recycled content, it just hasn't been successful enough because we still have this problem. So what is it we need to change? What are the things that we need to do differently now moving forward? And coming out of that trip, we had a lot of great projects that were started and a lot of commitments that were made by not just plastic producers, but by the companies using them and by the NGOs and the government officials who are helping to make that, you know, bring it all together. And it was pretty, it was pretty powerful trip and really exciting. But I bet you guys are all thinking what you can do to play your part. What is, what is it that every day, every day folk can do? And, and it's really simple. I want you guys also to rethink your relationship with plastics because every day we use plastics and some of those plastics we'll still have to use. Okay. But some of them we can, we can replace with reusable items, right? So we could use a reusable water bottle at school. We could use a reusable shopping bag. We could re use reusable snack containers. Um, but for those that we still need to use, we need to make sure we recycle them. So okay. what are you doing in your classroom you to recycle your recycle materials and making sure that you can get them, you know, end up for them to go to a place where they can make them into something new and they can have another life. So with that, I am going to open us up to some questions here and I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can engage with all of you. And I want to highlight that as you guys have, um, as you guys have questions today, and if you have any more, that you can you can go ahead and tweet them after we're done at um, Sustainable Aaron on Twitter. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go leave it there and and let you guys ask your questions. How do you want to manage that, Kate? Thank you so much, Aaron. That was awesome to hear about your trip and everything that you and your team have been working on on plastics. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna pass the mic throughout the classrooms to allow them an opportunity to ask you a question. So those of you on screen, get your questions ready. For those of you that are off screen, if you have questions, please feel free to submit them through the chat and we will take a look at those later. So let's start with Mr. Haas's class. If you guys have a question, go ahead. Really? Here, stand up and come sit towards the screen. There you go. I'm wondering, like what inspired you guys to start this and what made you think you should keep it going? Well, that's a great question. You know, I, you know, when I look at those pictures and when I look at that turtle wrapped up in a net, all I think about is how can I like, what is it that I can do to help do that? And, you know, for WWF, um, people often listen to us because we are, we're, we work hard to make sure we use great sound science to solve big world problems. And so we want to make sure that we take that best information possible and solve for that. So the why is because we have the tools, right? We know, we know why we have the problem. We know who we need to influence and so we, we're going to try to do that. And why we continue going is because of, you know, it's for, it's because we want this planet to remain the same for future generations. We want your children to be able to see sea turtles in the sea. And so um, I think that there's a lot that's driving us to make sure that we continue to preserve the world's species for both um, for both the species that need to depend on the planet and for, for the people who do too. I think I'm getting you guys. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Erin. Um, let's go to Miss Barry and our helping ninjas. Did you guys have a question for Erin? Um, yeah. 
We've thrown so much plastic into the. We've thrown so much plastic into the ocean. Is can we still take it out and cl and clean up on what we did, or is it too late and can we not reverse what we did? Oh, that's a really good question, right? And one that scientists are trying to figure out, especially when you know that you know uh, an explorer who just went down to the bottom of the Mariana Trench, you know, the deepest part of the ocean. What he found there, he found a plastic bag, and so. When you're talking about oceans that cover, you know, two thirds of the world, how do you get all of that cleaned up? And so there's two things we think about in solving for that. Number one, if you have a leaky faucet, do you pick up the mop first or do you turn off the tap? And so we know that we need to turn the tap off. And so a lot of the work that WWF is focused on is figuring out how to stop it going into nature. But there's a lot of other work that's working on how do we clean it up. So clean up technologies to clean up the big macro plastics that are on top of the surface. And then filtering technologies, technologies that might be able to, for us to pull some of those microplastics up. I honestly don't think we're going to be able to get it all because it's just everywhere and there's so much of it. But we need to sort of, we need to start to reverse that trend. We want to make sure that we don't have more plastic in the ocean than fish. And right now, unfortunately, we're on a path for that. So these, we're trying to do all the things we can to stop that. Okay, awesome. Um, let's go over to Miss Krosidos' class. What's your question for Erin? Uh, how do you spread your message? Oh, in a lot of different ways. Um, so it depends on who the audience is, right? If I'm trying to influence companies, I do that usually one-on-one -on -one or through um, different company platforms. When we're trying to influence policymakers, we want to do that by participating in providing input on legislation that's going forward or asking for calls to action through um, the UN environment, for example. Now, when we're trying to reach out to people, to the public and to our membership. We go through social media. We do it through um, programs like Wild Classroom. And we do it through, you know, putting up articles and blogs and making sure that people have access to as much of that as possible as we're going. Because the, the more you know, right, the more you have the chance to do something with that information. What a great question. You guys are doing awesome with these questions that you're coming up with. So let's head over to Miss Martin's class. What's your question for Erin? My, my question is, I studied, I studied with readers for my endangered species project, and I want to know if they are endangered because of plastic. Can I ask you to repeat that question just a little bit louder? I studied buquitas for my endangered species project, and I want to know if they are endangered because of the plastic. What was the name of the animal that you said you studied? Buquitas. Oh. Hmm. I'm not sure. I mean, so, are, and is that, you're talking about the dolphin, right? The type of dolphin? Yeah. So, um, what I, what I, I don't know for sure on that one, but I'm going to answer with to the best of my knowledge, because I know one of the, the risks that are facing dolphins today are ghost gear. So one of the types of plastic that we have that's in the ocean today is fishing gear that's been lost or, um, that fisher, you know, that fishermen have abandoned. And what unfortunately happens is that gear continues to fish and those big nets are really dangerous for large mammals like dolphins, right? And they get caught up in them. Um, and you saw that's what that turtle was caught it up in. And so for a, the risk that for um, these large mammals, and in fact, like a lot of species is this what we call derelict fishing gear or ghost gear because it continues to fish. So I do believe, yes, that that is something that they are at risk for. Okay, great. Let's see, Miss Wolford's class, can you guys hear us? Are you ready to ask a question to Erin? Yes, can you hear us? I know they may have had some trouble with their microphone. Um, can you hear us? Let's see. You guys are on, go ahead and ask Erin your question. Hi, um, okay, we just wanted to introduce everybody first to Mr. Cuddle. He is an Amore Leopard that we adopted through World Wildlife Fund. So we love you guys. Thank you so much. And we have a question from Scotty. Scotty, stand up. What are the wor worst types of plastic that um, an animals can eat? 
Oh, that's a really good question. And I say it's really good because scientists today are trying to also figure that out. We don't know a lot about what happens when fish eat plastic. We don't know how it impacts them um, because it's really hard to measure. And so uh, there's a new, a new sort of um, scientific field that's really been emerging over the past five years, which is um, looking at the bioaccumulation of toxins, and those are a lot of big words, in fish when they eat plastics. So what does that mean? Does it affect their reproduction? Do they have do they have less babies? Does it affect um, how they interact? Um, does it affect you know um, their appetite? One thing we know for sure with sea turtles, for example, is that when they eat a lot of plastic, or whales too, when they when they eat a lot of plastic, it fills their belly up, and then they're full, and so they don't eat anymore, and so sometimes they'll starve to death. So we we're trying to figure out if the different plastics have different impacts but we're still figuring out how to measure that. But that's an important question because once we learn it, then we can think about how we make products differently um, so that we don't use as many of those plastics where possible. Great question. That was a great first round of questions. You guys are doing awesome. You guys ready for round two? Get your second questions ready. We'll take it back to Mr. Haas's class. Go ahead and ask your second question. Hi, I'm Sarah. What on what can big companies do to support this? Oh, you know, that's what I'm asking them to do every day. That's a great one. Um, so a couple of things I'm asking. You know, when I said, when I told you guys I wanted you to rethink your relationship with plastics, that's exactly what I'm thinking of with companies. I want them to think, do, what do I need? What don't I need? Are there plastics today that I could be getting rid of? So if you think about um, the the straw, getting rid of straws and getting rid of carrier bags. That's the first step. Let's get rid of the stuff we really don't need. And then for the stuff we do need, because it has that conservation value that I was measure, mentioning earlier, how can we make it better, right? Can we make sure we use um, recycled content or sustainably sourced bio-based? So those are, those are feedstocks, so inputs into the plastic that could be renewable, right? And then how can I make sure that wherever it goes in the world, so whoever's using it, that they have access to either reuse it or to recycle it or to compost it because I want to get those materials back. So when I'm asking companies to act, I'm asking them to commit to those things. And then I'm also asking them to influence because once it leaves their hands, we need to make sure that it gets to the retailer, to the consumer, to the city, and then back again. And so we need to influence all of those key parties that play a role in that. So there's a lot companies can help us to do, and we ask them for all of it. Okay, great. Let's go back to Miss Barry and the ninjas. Go ahead. When did you decide to be a scientist and what is, and what inspired you to be a scientist? You know, that's a good question because when I first went to college, I didn't really know what I wanted to study. And I tried a lot of different things out. And then um, I discovered packaging engineering and I really liked it a lot. I really liked that I could try to problem solve for um you know, getting me right, just the right amount of materials to get the product safely to people. And as I was, as I got into my career as a packaging engineer, I started to really care and, and want to make sure that that everything I was making actually had a positive impact on the planet because I spent a lot of time outdoors like you guys clearly do. And I just didn't like the fact that there were things that I was helping to make that could potentially have a negative impact on it. So I think it's always been a part of who I am, but it, it slowly came together throughout my career. And when I got the opportunity to come to World Wildlife Fund, it really sort of brought all of that together for me. What a great question. Okay, Miss Martin's class, you guys are up. What can our school do to reduce the amount of plastics we use? Okay, good. All right. So I think you do the same thing, right? You start with what do we have, what are we using every day that we don't need, right? Are we are we using a lot of, are we using a lot of straws? Are we using a lot of like single use cups and forks and knives? Are there ways that we could replace those with things that we could reuse over time? I think for the, make sure you're working around, making sure that you have a place to recycle them or compost them is a good idea, right? So do you have recycling bins in every classroom and a, and a, a recycling that, a recycler that will pick it up? And if not, how could we engage your community, your, you know, the, 
the and, and ask them to have access to that service. And those are things that you could work with the teachers and the administration on. Um, but it starts with just thinking about like, what are we, what are we using today that we really don't need? Okay, great. Um, next up is Miss Wolford's class, if you guys can hear us. Yep, can we hear? Yeah. Yes. Okay, Nick, go ahead. Why do animals think plastic is food? You know, it was crazy. When I was on this trip, um, I, I, we, you know, we'd heard about the fact that, that, uh, that fish had been eating plastics. And I just really, I, it was hard for me to visualize. I understood, for example, why turtles ate plastic bags because turtles love jellyfish and plastic bags look a lot like jellyfish, right? Um, and, the, and so that made sense. But then as I was traveling and, and picking up these plastics from the beaches and, and pulling it out of the sargas and grass, I noticed something about all of these plastics. They had bite marks out of them and very clear bite marks where we could tell what kind of fish was eating them. Um, for example, the trigger fish really loved the plastic Clorox bottle that we picked up. Um, and so I was asking why that was. Is it because there's algae that grows on them? Is it because of the smell of the plastics? Um, is it because other other animals like um you know, attach themselves, barnacles attach them to the plastics over time. And so, you know, it's very hard since we're not in fish, like species heads to understand why they do it, but we're assuming it's a combination of all those things that sometimes their food grows on it. Sometimes it just looks like their food and sometimes it's just where their food normally is. And so um, what we want to do is make sure it doesn't get there anymore, right? Because we want them to be eating the right things and not plastic because I'm pretty sure that should not be a part of their diet. Okay, so we're going to hear from Ms. Crosado's class next, and then we'll take a couple of the questions that people submitted through the chat. So, Ms. Okay. Crosado's, go ahead. What, um, what type of scientists do you work with? Ah, oh, there are so many different types of scientists, and that's what's really great. So if you're curious about something, there's probably a field of scientists that ask questions similar to you. So I work with biologists, I work with marine biologists, I work with social scientists and information scientists. Those are the ones who try to figure out all with how we look at all this information. I work with GIS specialists, and they look at all the images we have of the Earth and how we can use those changing images to figure out what's changing in the world and how to make better decisions. I, of course, work with material scientists like myself. Um, and I work with folks who focus on water and on species and on technology. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of great scientists here at WWF. And through Wild Classroom, there'll be other experts like myself who'll be able to share their specialty too. Okay, so Erin, I'm gonna ask a few questions that we had submitted through the chat, if you're okay with that. So the first question here says, what happens if the plastic keeps building up even after the year 2030? Oh, I don't wanna think about that because really I think it is just, it's up to, the, it's up to us now. It's up to us now to stop this, right? We have a chance, an opportunity to turn this pretty catastrophic situation around and so if we're still looking at this situation in 2030, we've really, we've really missed our opportunity. So what that will look like is we'll have more plastic in the ocean than we do fish. And that will really impact the health of the oceans. And oceans provide us with a lot of the air we breathe. It help, the oceans determine our weather patterns. Um, and oceans provide a lot of fish and protein that we as a planet um, depend on. Uh, so it would be a pretty dire situation if we got to that point. So WWF is working pretty hard to make sure that doesn't happen. Definitely, let's all hope that that doesn't happen. Um, question number two submitted from the chat says, our class wants to know what are the best ways that we can help protect ocean animals? Wow, there's a lot we can do, right? Because while we're talked a lot today about plastic pollution and how that's impacting species, um, there's many things that are threatening our oceans today, right? We know that um, that the fact that we have climate change and our the and oceans are warming. We know that we have bleaching of corals. We know that we have our mangrove systems that are in danger, and we have a lot of species that are overfished. And so there's just so many opportunities for us to really think about that. 
as kids, I think you think about it in the way that you are just interacting with the food you eat and the stuff, you know, and the plastics that you're using um, around this issue, right? So let's let's get rid of the stuff we don't need and make sure we recycle so none of it ends up there. Um, let's look at, you know, there are, there are plenty of lists, and I, I don't actually know one off the top of my head that talk about the fish that are already being overfished. And so if you are, if you if you talk to your parents about and you guys eat a lot of fish, then um, making sure that they're sustainably sourcing those fish and, and using certified MSC certified or ASC certified fish, which help us to understand the way they're produced. Um, but I think continue to ask questions and continue to care about this because the more we elevate these issues that are hurting our oceans, the more chance that they'll get the attention they need to have the problem solved. Okay, awesome. Um, the next question that got submitted online is a tough one. What is microplastic made from? Ooh, so microplastics are any macroplastic that breaks down, right? So if you have a plastic pop bottle, Sorry for my Midwestern accent. Uh, if you take that, if that plastic pop bottle breaks down and no longer is a bottle and it's just a bunch of pieces, that's a microplastic. Another microplastic actually comes off of our clothing, right? So some of us wear polyester. So if you have jerseys for your sports, that's polyester. That is the same material that we use to make pop bottles. But when that, you know, as you wear it and you have like the fuzzies that come off, you know, that um, the pilling, whatever it's called, those are microfibers. That's the same thing. Those are just parts of the larger part. So a microplastic is one part of the larger macroplastic. So it can be any type. Gotcha. That was a good question. Um, trying to pick one more off the chat here. A question got submitted that asks, what ocean is most affected? Mm. Well... Today, science tells us that there, is, there are a couple of hot spots where the majority of plastic waste is entering the ocean. And so that is in Southeast Asia around what is called the Coral Triangle. So just if you come down the coast of China, you've got Indonesia and Philippines and Vietnam all right in there in Malaysia. And that area is called the Coral Triangle. And right now, the majority of plastic waste is coming from those countries into the ocean. So I would say because our, our oceans flow and continuously flow all over the globe, right? That it means that they are all really one, right? And so anything that's coming in there is, is gonna float around and get someplace else. Um, but that's where that's what we would call the front lines of this issue. That's where we're trying to turn that faucet off first. Okay, perfect. I'm gonna be a little conscious of the time of everyone's time here. So I'm gonna give an opportunity for our classes that are on screen to ask you one more question, Erin. For those of you that are on the chat, if you still have questions that weren't answered, Erin um, will probably repeat her Twitter handle at the end here so that you can be sure to tweet out your question to her. Uh, Mr. Haas's class, your last question. How many species are going extinct because of plastic use? Wow, I don't know that I can totally answer that. Um, what I can, what I do know, right, is that there's been already 800 different species that have been impacted by it. We know that like 95% of seabirds have ingested plastic and that it's not gonna be long before that's all seabirds. And so when you think about all of the factors that go into the extinction of species, whether that's being you know overconsumption, so when we overfish, um, whether that's because they are interacting with humans, you know, you know, coming into contact with those the fishing nets, or you know, closer to shore, they're getting hit by boats. You know, those different, you know, those different interactions, and then just the impact to the ocean itself, how um, how it is warming, how we have different acidic levels in the ocean. All of these things combined together just make it harder, harder, harder and harder on these animals to survive. And so while I don't know that we know exactly how plastics are contributing to their extinction, we know that looking forward when WWF asks, um, is looking at the factors that affect the species and biodiversity as a whole, that plastic pollution is now something we need to consider um, in regards to the health and, and the future of ocean creatures. Okay, great. Let's go to Miss Barry and the Helping Ninjas. Maybe not. Is she there? Okay. We'll come back to her if she jumps back on. Um, Miss Martin, did you guys have another question for Erin? Yes. 
Okay. So you want us to be creative? Yeah. Has any species gone extinct because of plastic? Yeah, I think following up on that last question, it's really hard for us to tell because there is a lot going on. Um, and a lot of things that um, these species are facing today, right? Um, and so we're not sure, but we know that um, we know that there it, it's not good, and so and we know that there that we need to stop that. So we're going to keep working on that. Um, but I don't have there is not one species that we could say it's just been plastic so far that has led to the extinction. And hopefully that won't happen. Um, Miss Wolford, you guys are up. Oh, uh, yes, there have been some. I wish I knew that off the top of my head because that would be helpful, but I don't actually know that. But I do know they come and go. So we could look into that and get back to you on that. But yeah, you know, we do a lot of work um, beyond obviously the oceans to bring other species back to the numbers they once were or start to do that. And so there are probably some really good success stories that we could share with you. Um, and I will make a note to see how to follow up and give you guys some more input on that. Okay, great. Um, Ms. Crocedo's class, your last question for Erin. Go ahead. Um, how much plastic does the average human use in one day? Gosh, you guys are really hitting me with the hard ones and all the numbers. Um, yeah, <laughs> so it averages. I mean, it, it depends, right? Depending on where in the world you are. Um, in some cultures, there it's a very to-go lifestyle, meaning that they they eat mostly out of their home and not inside of their home. And for those cultures, they consume a lot of plastics every day. And by consuming, they use it, right? And so for others, uh, for other cultures that where in-home dining is more common, they, they tend to use a lot less. Um, and so it's really, it's this point where we all got to think about those, those moments where we touch the plastic and we just sort of dismiss it right away after that, right? So if, if you think about your day and the plastic baggie that maybe you had a snack in and then just threw away, what are the opportunities for you to replace that with something reusable in the future? And that's the best way we're going to solve for this. So I'm sorry I don't have the exact number for for you, but uh, when there is a dump truck of plastic entering the ocean every minute, and we know that we have over 150 million metric tons of mismanaged plastic, not just going to the ocean, but total all over the world every year, uh, I think that that divides out to a lot of plastic per person per year. That's a really tough question. You guys are, are really picking yeah. up some good ones here. Um, okay, and last but not least, Miss Barry and the Ninjas. Are you guys back? Can you hear? Me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we can we can use eco friendly products and we can reuse plastic so we can avoid single use plastic. But what other solutions are there? You know, some of the interesting challenges we've got to think about is um, sort of really figuring out. Um, what what's the need that we use the plastic for and so replacing that not always with the plastic right so one of the ideas that coca-cola company is considering right now is not giving not giving you coke or pep you know sorry or coke or the other products in an actual bottle that you would just go to their fountain and be able to use your own container to fill it up and you know it would charge to a barcode on the bottom of your reusable bottle and stuff like that and so it's it's rethinking sort of how we use these products and get and get them that is going to be really some of the innovation we see um, another piece of it is going to be you know really figuring out how to get more innovation in waste management. We have we have different ways that we recycle materials today, but the limiting capabilities, the limited capabilities around those technologies mean that we can't recycle everything. And so it's also going to be about finding new technologies to recycle things that weren't recyclable before. Um, and so there's a lot that can happen in that space where I think that's going to get really exciting. Well, I think that about does it. If you guys had questions still for Erin that we didn't have time to get to today, like she mentioned, you can reach out to her on Twitter. Her Twitter name is Sustainable Erin, or you can also ask your teacher to email them to the Wild Classroom email box, and we will be happy to pass them on to Erin and get back to you. What I'm going to do now is unmute everyone's microphone so we can give Erin a really big thank you for her time today.
So everyone go ahead and say thank you to Aaron for it. Awesome. Well, Aaron, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. It was awesome to hear about everything you're doing at WWF with plastics. And teachers, if you still want more information on how to impact our environment and how to, you know, reduce your plastic waste, be sure to check out Wild Classroom Sea Turtle Toolkit and stay tuned for future opportunities to connect with our experts. So thanks everyone for joining us today online and off. And thanks again, Aaron. Thank you Thank guys you so much. much. Happy Ocean's Day. Thank you for caring. <laughs> Bye guys.